Hi. This week we're moving completely away from the topic of norm referenced or standardized assessments and we're going to begin to discuss informal observation tools and that informal observation tools are going to take us through the rest of this semester. So we'll be talking about a variety of them today and then adding more detail to some of the tools that we talk about in future weeks. So let's begin by talking about the problems related to norm referenced assessment and why we want to consider informal assessment tools along with norm referenced assessment. Well, first of all, as we've discussed, there's a lot of problems with various instruments that are, even though norm referenced, not necessarily as rel reliable or valid as we would hope them to be. There's problems with test administration and interpretation. So we know of some of the issues in terms of test administration, like bias, people being poorly prepared to give tests, even though they should be better prepared, uh, and interpretation, not necessarily uh, identifying the thing that's actually going on for a child, but uh, interpreting information in inappropriate kinds of ways or ways that are not meaningful to planning a good educational program. Also, if we think about norm-referenced assessment, and I think you'll find this when you look at your standardized tests that you'll be doing this semester, they don't always represent the material that are taught in the actual curriculum. So, for example, a norm-referenced test might be uh, based on the fact that in general children learn multiplication tables in the third grade. But in fact, in your school, or um, your district, children may not be introduced until, to multiplication until the fourth grade, or perhaps they're learning it even earlier, like in the first or second grade. So the test is based on an assumption about when particular materials are taught that may not represent your actual curriculum. And they're also based on assumptions about curriculum, particularly in terms of validity, which we've talked about, that um, that they represent actual curriculum. So we talked about in order to be valid, a test has to be complete in terms of what it's um, assessing, but often they're not really complete in terms of everything that is covered in an actual curriculum. So I take mathematics as a good example. When we talk about a particular grade level math, um, set of skills. Math isn't just computation. It's not just adding and subtracting and so forth. It's not just word problems. It includes um, things like geometry and algebra, even at the very earliest age. But the test may not have that wide range of things that are incidentals in the actual curriculum. The tests are also, norm reference tests are also biased towards certain curricula. So for example, they may be um, looking, using as their basis for creating items certain curriculum that are not representative of your curriculum. So they're biased against yours and biased in favor of another one. Many tests lack alternative forms, so like a Form A and a Form B, so we can only use them um, once a year, not more often because of test effects. Tests are not, norm reference tests are not sensitive to small gains in academic growth. One illustration of that, we'll go back to math, is in math, for example, you're probably looking at a student's ability to add numbers over a period of a year, growing from simple addition to more complicated addition, like two-digit by two-digit numbers. Well, a test, a standardized test, is only going to have one or two examples at most of each of those kinds of skills representing growth from just beginning to understand um, addition to being able to uh, utilize addition in a number of different ways with larger groups of numbers. They're not sensitive to the smallest gains, which we see over the course of the year. They're not sensitive to small gains in academic growth. And then, of course, as we've talked about at length already, there is cultural and linguistic bias in most of our norm reference tests. Most, if not all, of our norm reference tests have some kind of bias, whether it's a few items that are biased or the whole test itself that's biased against a particular cultural or linguistic group. And, and linguistically, particularly when we talk about English language learners, norm reference tests tend not to be useful for that population. 
So what are some of the alternatives to norm-referenced assessment? Well, we do have norm-referenced tests, and, and I want you to remember the definition of those. Norm-referenced tests compare a child's test results with those of a normative sample of children who have taken the same test. Those are known as standardized tests, or we can also talk about them in terms of formal assessment. So we have a variety of in somewhat interchangeable terms, norm reference, standardized, formal, and that is comparing your child, the child that you're interested in, um, against a normative sample of children who have taken the same test. And that's what gives us those comparative scores that we spent the last few weeks talking about. So put those aside for a moment, uh, or for the rest of the semester, actually. We're going to be talking about other kinds of things, like criterion reference tests, which compare a child's performance on a test to a specific criteria or instructional objectives, such as those in an IEP. Some are published and others are teacher-made. So an example of a published criterion reference test is the Brigantz, and that's widely used in our schools as well. What does it mean to, to compare a child's performance to a specific criteria? Well, think about um, academics as being developmental in nature. So that first you learn, go back to math, first you learn your numbers and the number values, and then you begin to learn how to put numbers together, how to add them together, and then you learn to subtract. Then you'll learn to add bigger and bigger numbers. You'll add regrouping to your to your knowledge about that. These all take place in a se in a sequence of development. Those are um, the criteria of mathematical growth. So what we do is take that kind of criteria, that sequenced set of developmental objectives or skills, and we compare a child's performance against that. So where on that um, continuum of mathematic growth does the child fall? So we're not comparing that child to other children. We're, we're simply looking at where are they on that developmental or academic academic scale. Uh, and we can, we can have a sort of general criteria, which is what we know about the sequence of learning, which is actually step by step spelled out in a, in a curriculum. Or we can look at instructional objectives that we've created because a child's not following the general ed curriculum. So those would be what happens in an IEP. Now, curriculum-based tests are a type of criterion reference test where the criteria is a specific sequenced curriculum. So let's go back to criterion. If we think about the Brigantz, the Brigantz is based on a general sense of development in various academic areas, a sequence of development that that is useful and can be applied to almost any student in this country in any particular grade level. So some of it would be relevant to or to all of the children that you work with, and some of it might be a little advanced for some of the children that you work with. Some of it might be not as advanced as it could be for some of the children that you work with, depending on the type of curricula to which they're exposed. But cur curriculum-based tests are actually measuring students' skills against the curriculum that they are experiencing in their educational uh, environment. So curriculum-based tests, they are criterion reference, but the criteria is the specific curriculum that the child is following. So we can compare the child, we can find out exactly where the child is in terms of the curriculum that they're placed in. And, and finally, we have observation. Now, observation is a pretty broad term. The observation is a process of gathering information by looking at children, recording their behaviors, their responses, and their characteristics, looking at the products of their interactions and their work, and the environments in which they learn. So observation is looking, but it's looking at a lot of different things, and there are many, many, many types of observation, and we'll be spending a lot of time talking about that. But we'll spend a whole uh, session on curriculum-based measurement, and so I'm not going to talk that much about that today, but we are um, going to spend a lot of time today talking about the process of observation. So what is observation? Well, observations, as we said, that's looking at a child, and we can do that in systematic ways or unsystematic ways. 
Unsystematic observations are qualitative in nature. In other words, we're not capturing number, we're capturing a quality of events. And we begin without any notions about what we're going to observe, and we simply describe behavior that is occurring that seems important. So we don't have an agenda when we do unsystematic observation. We're looking at what's taking place. Now, we may have um, something that we want to look at. For example, we might want to look at how the child, uh, what does the child look like when they're um, during reading period. So what do they look like when they're reading? What do they look like when they're responding to questions that are related to what they've read? And so forth. So reading may be the systematic part of it, but we are in general collecting everything we can about the child's behavior during that um, time period. We use anecdotal records. That's the most common form. You're probably all familiar with that. And that's a narrative record of aspects of a child's behavior, either as it occurs or after the fact. In general, we do um, anecdotal recording after the fact. That's when you sit down at the end of the day or the end of a session and you record uh, notes about the child's behavior based on what came up that seems important to you, or maybe an aha moment that you want to make a note of, or maybe um, you saw the child do something that you know that there's a goal or objective for them, uh, and they did something related to that, so you want to record that that happened. So those kind of moments or what typically gets get jotted down in an anecdotal record. A running record is a more structured form of anecdotal recording. We're still talking about unsystematic observation, but a running record is structured in the sense that we are um, we are looking at a child in terms of moments, specific moments in time. And I'm going to show you an example of that, but it is um, rather than recording something after the fact, jotting down notes about what we remember or what we think might be important, a running record is capturing everything that's going on in a time-sequenced kind of way. Now the problem with both um, anecdotal records and running records are that they take time to do and both of them can be very subjective. So one of the things that we want to try to do if we're doing unsystematic observations is to try to keep our notes as objective as possible. So for example, to say, the child was happy. Well, that's subjective because you're making a judgment about um, how the child felt, which you can't know unless you are, you are the child or you actually ask the child how they were feeling at that moment in time. Um, a, an objective way to, be, to record that would be the child had a big smile on his face. The child was laughing. The child was um, playing actively with the materials that were presented to him. Things that describe what the child does as opposed to uh, judgments about how you think the child is feeling at that moment in time. So we have to try very hard to be objective and that can be difficult. So um, we tend to move, we tend to use anecdotal records and running records as a beginning and as a, as a way of capturing also aha moments but, uh, but then when we identify specific things that we want to look at and measure, we move towards systematic observations. And systematic observations are more quantitative. They record numbers of things uh, or times or amounts so that we ha have an actual record that can be charted over time reflecting the child's behavior. Then we look at specific aspects of a child's behavior and um, again as I said we often graph the results. So uh, during the time from now on that we'll be talking about various forms of informal assessment. We're going to be talking a lot about graphing, but it's graphing in a way that's somewhat different from how we were talking about it before. Here's an example of an anecdotal record. So this is just teacher's notes on what was happening for a child during a particular lesson. So this particular lesson was in math class. You can see Sam was sitting at his desk working on a division worksheet. 
His head was down and he was tapping his right foot. The room was quiet except for the low voice of the teacher who was helping another child. So you see, we're trying to capture aspects of the environment as well as aspects of Sam's behavior. Sam being our target. Sam started to look around the room. He looked at the pictures posted above the whiteboard. He looked behind him. He dropped his pencil. Then he got up and walked to the sharpener. He touched every desk on his way there and back, and he sat, he sat down, but he did not do any work. Now, that's, that's a record that someone made as they were actually observing Sam in that environment. There's a lot of detail in it. There might not be that much detail if we were doing an after-the-fact anecdotal record. And on this form that you'll, you'll see, the, there's room left for comments. So I want to um, just stop for a second in uh, looking at this and talk about how we have to create some kind of recording form or protocol, if you remember that term. We have to use some kind of recording form even as we move towards informal assessment and observation-based kinds of assessment. So here's an example of a recording form, and it has some of the key features that a recording form should have. It has the student's name, the observer's name, it gives us a date and a time, and it tells us the place in which this observation is um, taking place. And here's a form that can be created and be made available in the classroom or in your office where you can jot down these kind of notes whether at the moment that they're happening or after the fact and this sheet also gives you an opportunity to make comments to review the anecdote and to ask questions that may later lead to more systematic observations so some of the questions does he need to keep his head low to see the paper we could do a follow-up assessment of that is he usually antsy? Well, we might have to do an observation over time to see if that's his typical behavior. And why would that be important? That may tell us something about um, how that task or those tasks that he was being asked to do um, were affecting him. Why did he get distracted? How long did he work before getting up? So that's another kind of question that may lead to a more systematic observation, and we'll see how that plays itself out. And was he trying to get a response from other students when he was tapping on their desks? And why did he quit working? So these are follow-up questions. So a teacher may decide to do more anecdotal recording of Sam during math class, or the teacher may decide to move towards some more systematic kinds of observation to get more specific data about SAM that may be helpful in an intervention. Here's an example of a running record. And again, notice that we have the same kinds of things available. We have the name, we have the observer's name, again, the date and the time, and the math class. So here, we're writing specific things um, at specific time intervals or as they occur. So at 10 o'clock he's working on his division sheet, 10.02 he's looking at the whiteboard, 10.03 he's looking at the student behind him, and so on. So and again there's room for comments. So what's he doing when he's looking at the student behind him? What's he doing when he um, walks to the sharpener? What's he doing um, when he walks back to the desk and so forth? And the comments include the fact that he's not working. So in this, we're recording the times that these notes are being made. And you could see that the classroom teacher is really not going to have the time to do this kind of detailed recording, where they might have had the time to jot down a note after math class about Sam's behavior. They, um, having the time to do this detailed, systematic, uh, somewhat systematic look at, uh, at the child's behavior uh, is probably not possible during a lesson, but this is something an assistant could do, and this is something an outside observer. For example, if I were going in because I was going to be testing Sam later, uh, if I were in his classroom to get to know him and to do some observations about him before I did the testing, these might be the kinds of notes I would take that would allow me to um, come up with some questions that I might want to examine in closer detail. Now we're going to move to systematic observation. And there are various kinds of systematic observations. Here's a list of the ones that we are going to cover. I'm going to show you some examples of these. 
The first is a frequency record, which is how often a behavior occurs. So that's a number that we can record. The next is a duration record, which is how long a behavior lasts. Then a time sample, which is behavior occurring at the end of an interval or time segment. Then we have an interval record, recording the occurrence of a behavior or not during any part of an interval. Task analysis and scoring by levels, which is breaking down a target behavior into small, isolated, sequential steps. A checklist, which is an array of characteristics or behaviors that allow us to note the presence or absence of characteristics or behaviors. And then rating scales, which measure the degree to which a child exhibits a pre-specified behavior. Well, whew, that's a lot of, of names and a lot of definitions. And as we go along, I hope the illustrations will show you how, what these are and how they can be used. And there's information in the book about this as well, so don't forget to take a look at that. Here's an example of a frequency record. And note again that this is something that could be used over and over again to um, record how often a behavior occurs. So, for example, he never raises his hand. So we would have the behavior raising one's hand to ask a question or to make a comment, a defined behavior. And that's very important for systematic recording, to have a defined behavior that we could all agree upon. So it has to be objective we would have to all be able to say, I saw that behavior occur. I know what that behavior looks like. So in this particular example, the behavior is being out of your seat without permission. So could we all agree that we would know what that looked like? And I could, I could record how often the student got out of their seat without permission. So on this form, there's room for the behavior carefully, objectively defined, and there's also room for the child's name, the observer, and the location. Now, I could make this form better, and I would urge you to try to think about how you could make it better, too. For example, I could have times added to the record somehow. That might be helpful. Or I could have um, some uh, place for comments or notes. So for example, look at um, the, the 22nd of January and the frequency of him being out of his seat without permission was six total times. Well, six, is that a lot? When did that occur? Was I observing over the whole day? That's not on the record form. Perhaps it should be. So what kind of a time period was that taking place? Was it a particular class, like a math class versus a reading? class. Um, I might want to know the difference between the frequency of the student getting out of their seat without permission during math classes versus the frequency of getting out of their seat during reading class. That's going to begin to tell me some information. So I would want to add to this form, but basically a frequency record is simply noting that the behavior happened and how often it happened. And once you've created this form, the only thing you need to do when that behavior happens is make a little hash mark. And that's a lot easier than taking anecdotal notes. Uh, it, it's less time consuming, but it begins to give us some data. And the more we manipulate the form and make the form better, the better our data is going to be. So here's an example of a duration record, how long um, some, some particular behavior occurs. Now in this particular case, we're looking at the behavior, which is time spent working on a worksheet during math class. Here's an example of trying to define attention to task. Attention to task is not a behavior that's easily observed. It's more subjective, whether someone is paying attention or not. What does attention look like? Well, here's uh, an objective description of what attention looks like for this particular uh, recording sheet, and that's time spent working on a worksheet during math class. So we could all agree that we could see whether the child was working on their worksheet or whether they had stopped 
working on their worksheet and were doing something else. Now remember Sam? He did a lot of looking around. He got up out of his seat. He tapped his pencil. He tapped his foot and so forth. There were times during that math class that Sam was not working. He was doing something else. And the question is, how much time did he spend on task? Which on task being working on his worksheet. Well, this kind of a recording sheet allows us to um, to make note of that. And again, we could make it better. We could make our spaces for beginning and ending an activity a little bit be bigger so we could jot some notes down, like why did he end the activity? Uh, was he, was he, we could have some codes like he was distracted or um, something happened outside the classroom that drew his attention or you know, whatever. It might be interesting to know why he stopped working, but Basically, we note that he began the activity at 9.30. He worked steadily until 9.37, then something happened, and he stopped working on his worksheet. He spent seven minutes on task. Now, that doesn't end there, because math class is, let's say math class is a 45-minute period. So when does he go back to task? Perhaps Sam st started working on his worksheet again at 9.40 and he continued to work on his worksheet to, until 9.43, giving us three more minutes on task, and so forth. So during that whole math class, that 45 minutes, we simply would note the time that he started working again on, his act, on the activity and the time that he stopped working and did something else, like walked around or was otherwise distracted. And then we would have across the bottom a record of the number of minutes that he actually spent on task against the, against the time that the task was presented. So remember math class was a 45 minute time period. So how many minutes out of that 45 minutes did, ta did Sam actually spend working on a task? And we'll get a percentage of time on task. Now this should be starting to sound a little bit like an objective to you. So, and so should the frequency record, by the way. When we write objectives, we write objectives like he will do such and such um, on six out of ten trials, or he will stay on task for 80% of the time. So these worksheets, these assessment protocols that we're developing for our informal kinds of assessments will enable us to actually have a record over time of whether the student is increasing in a particular behavior or not. So as an example, let's say that Sam has an objective, because he is easily distracted, that one of the objectives on Sam's IEP is that he will increase his time on task to 75% of the time on task. Here's a worksheet that would allow us to collect baseline data on Sam. How, what does he look like at the beginning of our intervention and let's say at the beginning of our intervention, we, we do an observation using this kind of a record sheet, and we see that his percent of time on task is about 40%, and we need to get him to 75%. So now we begin to do an intervention to increase his time on task, whatever that might be, and periodically, as we implement that intervention, we can use this same record form to note whether Sam's uh, time on task behavior is increasing. So now at the end of the year, when we go to Sam's IEP and we look at that objective, did Sam meet his objective to staying on task 75% of the time? We actually have a data sheet that provides evidence that in fact Sam has grown over time, I hope. Uh, and, and before we even get to the IEP, we should have been looking at such a data collection sheet 
and noting whether Sam was making progress or not. Because if we note that he's not making progress, if, if, if his time on task is not increasing, then we might want to change our intervention or increase the intensity of it or do something so that by the end of the year we get to our objective. Here's a record of it. And remember I mentioned it could be graphed. So we can look at having a y-axis that um, notes the percent of time on task going from a, his baseline of 40%, let's say, up to the desired goal of 75%. And we can record, even if we did this, let's say, once a month or twice a month, we could, on our horizontal axis, be recording the dates that we were using this record so that we could plot each, uh, the result of each observation over time, and we would hopefully see growth to that 75% line that we're aiming for. That's how we might graph this. Now that serves as a nice record for Sam as well because Sam knows that he has an objective to increase the time spent working on task. And he can now graphically see, he can see a, a record sheet that shows exactly how much time he spends on task during a class. And he can also see a graph that shows over time that he's improving, which is a great incentive. And since this is math, Sam could also be graphing this for himself, which is a great math lesson. Here's an example of a time sample. And in a time sample, we're looking at whether or not the child is doing the behavior that is targeted at the particular time that we take our sample. Now that means we're not observing the child every single moment of every single day but we are observing the child uh, at particular times during a, a particular um, activity. So let's say that this, and this sheet could be improved by adding activity to it. So let's say the activity is math class um, slash it is uh, independent worksheet time during math. And that usually takes place in this classroom from 9.15 to 9.30. So right after the lecture, students are given worksheets to do independently, and that's for a 15-minute time block. Now, I'm a teacher with 15 students in my class, all of whom need particular help accomplishing their independent worksheets, so I don't have time to be taking uh, extensive anecdotal notes, but I do want to know whether Sam, back to Sam, is actually attending to his independent worksheet or if he's doing something else. So I have simply on today's date, I have the, I look up at 9.15, which was when the activity starts, and it's, do, is Sam attending, yes or no, a check mark or a minus mark? It's, I simply look up, put a check mark if he's attending, put a minus if he's not. At 9.20, I look up again, and I see, is Sam attending? Check mark if he is, and a minus if he's not. 9.25, look up again. Is Sam attending to his worksheet? Check mark if he is, minus if he's not. You get the picture, I'm sure. So I have a, a total at the bottom, I should have a total at the bottom of how many times during this time sample was Sam caught, if you will, actually attending to his independent worksheet. Now, the problem with this is obvious. Maybe Sam was attending to his worksheet from 9.16 to 9.19, and he only got distracted at 9.20, and that's why he got a minus. And maybe he went right back to attending, and from 9.21 to 9.24 he was attending, but when I looked up at 9.25 he was distracted. So I'm not getting a true picture of the amount of time, like duration gave us the amount of time the student actually spends working working independently, but I am capturing a little bit about whether he's um, attending uh, or not to his worksheet. So this is quick. Uh, it might be useful when we have a large group of students that we have to be working with and we can't be noting specifics about time, but we can glance up every once in a while at specified time to just mark yes or no. We could 
develop this worksheet a little bit further and have codes about the type of distractions or the type of distracted behaviors Sam might exhibit. That takes us back to the anecdotal record. Remember Sam was distracted by students behind him. He was distracted by his pencil. He wanted to get up and walk around. So I could have uh, symbols or letters that would indicate what Sam was doing when I looked up if he wasn't attending. So like a W for walking around instead of just a minus, or um, an L for looking at another student, and so forth. So I could actually make this a little bit richer, and I could also expand each of the blocks to give me room for comments, although I've made room for comments at the end. These are just sample worksheets, and you can work with them to make them better to, um, to get at what it is that you want to get at when you're doing observations of a student. Here's an example of an interval record, and this is during a specific time period, a specific interval, is the child doing, how often is the child doing a particular behavior that we're interested in? And in this particular case, the behavior has been objectively defined as the number of times a child indicates a communicative behavior and the number of times the child responds to a communicative behavior. So I have two time periods on this record sheet, 9.15 to 9.30 and 12 to 12.15. And uh, they may have been chosen for a particular reason. So maybe 9.15 to 9.30 is recess. That's a nice place for communication to occur or what do we call it, nutrition now, or, and maybe 12 to 12.15 is the lunch break, another good time for um, communicative behaviors to occur. And I'm so I want to note what the environment is and what the activity is. I have room for that on my recording sheet. And during that interval of time, let's say 9.15 to 9.30, I'm going to do a frequency count, hash marks, of um, whether or not the child initiated, how often that happened, so hash marks for that, and whether or not the child responded to someone else communicative behavior. So that's the R, and I would have hash marks for that, giving me a total number of uh, initiations and responses. And once again, I could make this more complicated. I could perhaps have a code that would be the first name of any child that the, that, um, this particular student attempted to communicate with or uh, what child attempted to communicate with that child uh, in order to elicit a response. So I could get a little bit more complicated. I could get even more complicated than that by making notes about what the initiations or responses were about. But essentially this is a, is a frequency count of, um, of a behavior during a particular time interval. Here's one that I particularly like, and this is a task analysis and scoring by levels worksheet. You've in other classes probably talked about task analysis as an instructional tool. What we use task analysis for instructionally is to break a task down into teachable steps. So that, uh, let's take tying your shoe, for example, that's a nice objective behavior. That has a set of steps to it that are teachable. First you cross your um, laces, then you tuck one lace um, under the, the hole made by the cross. I could get better at describing this, but you know, if you looked at tying your shoes, you kind of, and then you pull it tight, then you make your loop, and so on. You know all the things, all the steps that go into being able to tie your shoes. Well, those, each of those steps is a teachable task for a student who's struggling to learn how to do that. This, but we can also, um, in addition to using it as a way of teaching the task, we can also use it as a way of measuring a student's progress in learning a task. And I, what I've done here is put a scoring levels code for you because students don't just do it or not do it. Students do it with various levels of assistance. So going back to tying your shoes, for example, uh, at the first step is making the X. Can the student do that? 
do they do it independently? So if you say, you know, if you give them their shoes, that's a natural prompt. That's worth a six. That's as high a score as you can get. If you give, if you put their shoes on their feet, there's your cue, natural cue. Does the student actually independently go and pick up the laces and make the X? If they do that, they get a six. If you put their shoes on and then you they don't do anything and you have to point to the laces and then they pick them up and make the X, that's a gestural prompt that's worth a five. If you give if you put their shoe on, you try pointing to the laces, they don't do anything, and you say, What do you need to do? An indirect verbal prompt, that's worth a four. If you if that didn't work, the next level would be a direct verbal prompt, which would be make the X. And if that still didn't work, the next level would be to model, to show them how to make the X. And if that still didn't work, the final and most intrusive step would be to actually guide them hand over hand to make the X with their laces. So now for that step, we have a number that represents the level of independence uh, by which the child could complete that step. And we do this for each step in the task analysis. And now we can get a percentage of independence with which the child can perform the task of, in this case, tying the shoes independently. This is helpful if you're working with students that have particularly significant needs or who are really struggling with a task that can be objectified and analyzed. If you can, if you can do a task analysis of the task and the student is really struggling with it, this kind of an assessment recording sheet can be very helpful because it helps you see small steps that the student is making towards towards attaining the objective uh, when students may look like they're not really getting close to the objective at all. So for example, tying the shoes, maybe after six weeks the student still isn't independently tying their shoes and you're thinking, if you haven't been looking, you're thinking, hmm, I'm not getting anywhere. But if you use this kind of task analysis and scoring by levels worksheet, at the end of five or six weeks, you hopefully have a record, a record of progress from maybe very low levels of independence to higher levels of independence, some sort of steps towards independence. And you can look specifically at each step in the task analysis and see which of the steps need more intensive intervention efforts on your part. So I really like this kind of an assessment protocol because it really helps you see the progress that you're making and it can help the students see the progress they're making as well. And again, the kind of thing that we'd be graphing would be a percentage score, so the percent of increase towards independence for this particular analyzed behavior, something else that we can graph. Now checklists. Checklists we can make for almost anything that, um, that we want to gather information about perhaps a whole group of students that uh, on, on skills or behaviors that are of some importance to us, but we don't want to necessarily zero in on a frequency or a duration or that kind of thing. Checklists are um, compile a set of behaviors and allow us to check off whether a student has that behavior or not, whether it's positive or a negative. So in this particular case, this is coming into the room ready to work. So the child's name gets entered. We can have a worksheet like this or a checklist like this for every student in our class. And we would note how they enter the room, whether they run in or enter quietly. You all know what the rules are. Do they come in prepared? Do they have paper and pencil? Check. Do they have their math book? Check. Have they completed their homework? Check or not. And then work habits. What do they look like during math class? Are they working effectively? Do they begin the worksheet when directed? And so forth. So here are the behaviors that we want all of the children to exhibit. We could actually use this independently with a student with whom we're
are working on a particular set of skills like this, even in a one-on-one -on -one situation. And it's, it allows us to record whether the student has this particular set of behaviors and even zero in on what, like look at entering the room, what the problems are, whether it was running in or entering quietly. I'm sure you could generate a better list than this. So we can just every once in a while check off whether the students are exhibiting the proper behaviors for being ready to work. And I'm sure you could think of a lot of other things to create checklists for. And there's a variety of checklists that are out there that you um, can access. And a rating scale. Rating scales uh, are help us look at behaviors that are difficult to quantify. In other words, we can't count how often something occurs, for example. We're trying to capture something that's a little bit more ethereal. It doesn't have a real number to it. So look at this particular rating scale. We're talking about uh, the degree to which a student engages in physical activities. Well, engagement is somewhat objective. We know whether you're doing it or not, but what does true engagement mean? What does it really look like? Well, we take something that's a little bit more subjective like that and we use a rating scale because we're using our judgment to rate this student a particular student against what our expectations of students are or perhaps what the other students look like in the group so given a group of students in a physical education activity one student who's um, who we're targeting what to what degree does the student engage in warm-up activities on a scale of one to five five being really gung-ho about the warm-up activities starts right in participates the whole time whatever you call engagement to a one being not participating at all so compared to other students because that's where our judgment comes in how does this student rate to what degree do they engage in team activities on a scale of one to five? To what degree do they demonstrate team leadership? Again, hard to define, but something that we know what it is when we see it. And we know that some students are fives and some students are threes and some students are ones and so forth. So rating scales allow us to be somewhat objective in things that tend to be somewhat more subjective. And then finally, uh, I, these are not uh, uh, unsystematic or systematic observations, but these are more uh, different types of informal assessment tools, some of which we're going to be talking about in much greater detail as we go along. So these are academic observations. We have performance assessment, and we're going to spend a day uh, later on in the semester or a week working on performance assessment. So I'm not going to go into much detail about it here. But performance assessment is looking at dem the student demonstrating a specified behavior that is linked to specific goals and objectives. And in performance assessment, students actually perform an activity or behavior and then provide explanations for their answers. So an example might be in a science lesson demonstrating your understanding of how volcanoes work by actually building a volcano. Um, we've all probably remember doing that or maybe have given that to students to do as a science activity. And then, the, so the students demonstrate their understanding of how volcanoes work or look by creating their own volcano, demonstrating how the volcano works, you know, the lava coming up and so forth, and then giving an explanation for why that happened. That's an example of performance assessment, and we'll be seeing more examples of that. Portfolio assessment is a way of evaluating student progress, strengths, and weaknesses using a collection of their own work samples. And portfolios can be done in a number of ways. The two extremes would be to be uh, to have portfolios in which the materials to be placed in the portfolio are defined by the teacher. So, uh, so you will be placing your essay from this particular class in your portfolio. You will be uh, creating a 
art project using clay. A picture of that's going to go into your portfolio. So that's teacher defined. To the other extreme, where the whole portfolio is student defined, students collect samples of their best work over a period of time and they determine what to place in their portfolio. So portfolio samples are actual student work or pictures of student work collected over a period of time that show growth over time in different areas of development. So we might start the year out, for example, in an English writing class. We might start the year out by having the student write to a prompt and saving their first sample written essay in their portfolio. And then periodically throughout the year, we may take uh, examples of their essays and put those in their writing portfolio until we reach the end of the year in which we ask the students to write to a prompt again, and that gets placed in their portfolio as a reflection of the skills that they now have after the course of um, a year of learning about writing. Those allow us to look at progress so we can rate each sample on, on certain criteria that we develop. Often portfolio assessment is linked to rubrics, so we may have a rubric for essays in our writing class that we use to rank or rate each student's essay that they place into their portfolio, and then we would have then a record of changes over time in terms of how those essays were rated. And uh, we could do it for all subjects, so all subjects could be included in the portfolio, or do it in a particular area like math or writing or something like that. So, so that's a collection of work samples. Teacher-made tests are another kind of academic observation that's widely used, and that's we look at whether the students have acquired skills that the teacher has taught, and it's usually used to, ask, to assess a subset of skills within a curriculum. So an example of a teacher-made test, weekly spelling tests. So we're teaching the students a set of words um, and rules that, that uh, surround those particular words and we give them a test at the end of the week or the end of the month to see how well they've learned those words or rules that's that we've created ourselves and that and the percentage correct on that here's a place that we'll use that will um, will be recorded and hopefully we want to see that percentage correct grow over time we can use teacher-made tests for a variety of aspects of the curriculum. And then diagnostic teaching. Diagnostic teaching, simply put, is teach, test, change the strategy, and repeat. So it's, it's what we do, really, but diagnostic teaching is a fancy word for it. Systematically manipulating instructional conditions to determine the most appropriate strategy for teaching a skill to a particular student, and obviously then measuring their progress. So we have we have a skill that we want to teach. We spend some time teaching it. Then we test the student to see how much they've learned. Let's take spelling. So we teach a set of spelling words for the week and the rules that go along with it. And at the end of the week, we test the students with a spelling, weekly spelling test. And Sam, our student, gets a 60% correct on his spelling test. Well, that's not a passing grade. That's not good enough. And so we decide that Sam needs help based on the test data, and we modify the strategy that we're using to teach him according to the results that we got on the test. Sam's not learning the way that we're teaching, so we're going to change the way we're teaching, and maybe we'll have Sam, uh, we've told them to take the words home and study them. Maybe he doesn't know what that means, so we're going to modify the strategy and tell Sam that he has to write each word ten times every night until Friday. Uh, that's our new strategy, to have him practice over and over again. 
And then uh, again, we give another spelling test at the next at the end of the next week, and we see is Sam doing better based on that strategy that we use. And maybe Sam's now getting 65 percent correct. So we determine from that that that's still not a good enough strategy, having him write it over and over again. So we try to think of what would be another strategy that we could use to help Sam get better at learning his spelling words. And we keep on doing that, changing our strategy based on test data until Sam begins to achieve the kind of success we want him to achieve. If he needs to get to 85% accuracy on a spelling test to be considered proficient, we have to have a level that we want him to achieve. Then we keep doing the test, teach, modify procedure until we consistently get him performing at that 85% level. That's diagnostic teaching. So I said I'd talk about some of these things in a little bit more detail. What I'm going to focus in on is uh, portfolio assessment. And later on, uh, uh, during other weeks, we'll be talking about some of the other assessment tools. So portfolio assessment, we're looking at student progress, strengths and weaknesses, using a collection of different measurements and work samples. Samples are collected over a period of time usually the course of a, of a school year or, the, or a set of intervention sessions, you can determine the period of time over which you want to collect samples. And the uh, essential elements of an effective portfolio are that it needs to be authentic and valid. What is authentic? Authentic is real. What is valid? That it's, that it's reflecting what it is that we are trying to achieve. Validity in this case is if you're teaching writing skills, for example, then you want to have a portfolio that reflects what the student really can do, real world accomplishments in writing. That's valid. And so we'd have to think about what are some authentic examples of writing that a student might be required to do in real life. That's part of being authentic. And so Students have to write letters or emails. Students have to take notes in class. Students have to write essays. So all of those are examples of things that are authentic measures of writing skills and valid measures because they are really, they, they look like writing. Um, and remember, validity includes completeness, whether it looks like the, the subject and how the student is asked to do it. So in terms of writing, it would obviously, we would have to think about, do we want them to do it in handwriting? Do, is it okay? Are we talking about things that are computer generated? What are the ways that we want the student to demonstrate those skills? And then they have to encompass the whole child, uh, being the various ways that the student can actually demonstrate those skills, thinking, learning, and demonstration, uh, across his own set of abilities. And then we want to think about repeated observations of various patterns of behavior. So a portfolio is gathering information over a period of time, but it isn't just start get a, get a set of information at the beginning and get a set at the end, but we're doing repeated observations of various aspects of the behavior that we're interested in. I'm talking about writing skills. So over the course of the semester or the school year, we are gathering information from repeated observations, and then it's continuous over time, so it takes place across that whole period. We use a variety of methods for gathering the evidence of student performance, pictures, um, recordings, uh, computer-generated results, uh, actual materials that the student creates, and so forth. We provide a means for systematic feedback to be used in the improvement of instruction and student performance. So we just don't gather the materials, but we, we evaluate those materials using some kind of rubric or some kind of standard that enables us to show the student 
where they're at in the development of this particular skill and how their materials represent that and how their materials represent increases in their ability over time. And then we provide an opportunity for joint conversations and explanations between students and teachers. Portfolios require you to sit down and talk with the student about what it is that they are putting in the portfolio, what that means and how it reflects information about them. Uh, they also allow for opportunities for conversations between teachers and parents. Portfolios are something that the teacher can share with the parent during parent conferences. And then um, students and parents as well. Students can talk to their parents about what it is that they've collected. I remember my uh, my youngest son, his middle school had a portfolio assessment process that began in sixth grade and culminated in eighth grade with a final presentation. And throughout the course of his middle school experience, he was gathering materials with the assistance of his teacher and placing them in his portfolio and organizing that over time into groups of information that represented him things that were important to him and how he had grown in those things over time. Also related obviously to the curriculum and the types of things that he was learning. And finally, uh, he parts of it would be presented to me during uh, parent conferences. I would get to see parts of his, um, his work that were, was in his portfolio. But at the end, he did a presentation to not just myself and his, um, his father and siblings, but he did a presentation to a whole group of parents. Each student did a presentation to the parents of their personal portfolio with explanations about why they had collected what they had collected, what it meant to them, and how it represented the growth over time that they had experienced in middle school. So it was a great um, opportunity for me to see portfolio assessment really in action and see the process of conversation and explanation that, that demonstrated learning. And that's what assessment is all about. Some examples of portfolio assessment, samples of student writing, story maps, reading logs or dated list of books that the student has read, a vocabulary journal, artwork, project papers, photographs, other products of work completed, group work, papers, projects and products, a daily journal, writing ideas, reading response log, learning log or writing form, assigned reading during the year, letters to pen pals, letters exchanged with a teacher, out of school writing and artwork, unit and lesson tests collected over the grading period, or academic year. These are just some examples. When uh, I teach also in the CLEAR credential program and the students who are doing the initial induction class in the CLEAR credential program are asked to put together a portfolio representing their growth as a teacher over time as they as they work through their CLEAR credential program. So they're teaching and um, so how are they changing from their uh, evaluations that took place at the end of the preliminary credential and the goals and objectives that they set for themselves at the end of that period, how are they changing and growing based on that now that they're technically done with their credential? And I, so they put together a portfolio and it can have any of these kinds of ideas. Um, they gather things that they've sent out to parents. Like for example, let's say that their goal was to increase parent participation in the classroom. So over the course of their clear credential induction period, they may collect newsletters that say they send out to the parents, notices of parent teacher nights, teacher conferences, that sort of thing. Um, they might save notes that parents have sent to them. They might send, uh, they might take uh, some examples of student um, behavior booklets that have gone back and forth between the teacher and the parent. Lots of different types of things that at the end of the clear credential induction period, they can put into their portfolio and say, based on this objective, here's the kinds of things that I did that represent me. So portfolios are very individualized and they reflect the way that a given student approaches learning. And 
the way that they see their strengths and that they're able to demonstrate their knowledge the best. So finally, putting it all together. In terms of uh, assessment in general, we want to gather background information about the child. We conduct a formal assessment. And this is something that you'll be doing. So you're, for your target child, you will gather background information. You'll conduct your formal assessment using your, in your case, using your norm reference test. But if we were talking about assessment processes in general, you could also be using a criterion reference test or both. So we use those formal tools. And then we look at student responses, we analyze errors, we look at the behaviors during assessment and so forth. We develop hypotheses based on that, based on the results of formal testing and our analysis of errors. We develop hypotheses about why we think the student is making the errors that they're making and what we think it is that the student needs to learn in order to correct those errors. And then we choose, we develop informal measures to test our hypotheses. So if, my, uh, if I'm looking at student behavior in math, for example, and I see that they're struggling with regrouping, that they seem to be on the standardized test or the norm reference test, those were the problems that they seem to um, get wrong. But there's not a lot of those on the norm reference test, so I want to develop an informal measure because I'm thinking that they don't, my hypothesis is they don't know about regrouping. So I want to develop an informal measure to test that hypothesis. Perhaps I'll put together a teacher-made test of um, addition problems with and without regrouping, more than what the norm reference test had on it. I might decide to do an observation of the student while they take that teacher-made test. I might decide to do an interview of the student. We really haven't talked about interviews, but that's another form of informal assessment. The interview being, why did you answer the question in that kind of way? Or tell me about how you solve these problems. And I might decide to get some additional background information about the student's experience in math. So those are informal measures I'm going to use to test my hypotheses that regrouping is where the student struggles. Then I'm going to conduct my informal assessments get in for, and analyze the student's responses and the student's behaviors based on those informal assessments. Then I'm going to develop and implement instructional plans based on that data. So now see I've tested and then I'm going to develop plans for teaching. I'm going to teach. And then on an ongoing basis, I'm going to monitor student progress. And that's how assessment fits into the picture of really identifying what a student needs to work on and whether or not our programs are working to enable the student to make progress. So I'm going to stop there because next week is the midterm. And I'm sure that you want to spend a lot of time going back over these video lectures, going back through the PowerPoints and the readings and everything to, get, to gather your thoughts before you go ahead and take the midterm. Next week it opens when the week begins and you uh, can go in and take that midterm at any time. But once you open the midterm, this is really important to remember, once you open the midterm, you have to finish it. You can't close it and then come back to it later. You have uh, two hours and 50 minutes in which to complete the midterm. Once that time is up, whatever you've completed up until then is what is submitted. You can't continue to work on it beyond that point in time. So you do need to study. You do need to get ready. You do need to get your thoughts organized so that you will be able to go ahead and do a good job on the midterm. And midterm covers everything that we've talked about in the last seven weeks, and that's a lot of information. So I'm giving you no topical activity for this week. Your activity for this week is to get ready for next week for the midterm, and good luck with that.